Uh, hi again, my name is Geneviève Zubrzycki. I'm director of the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia, and I'm uh, thrilled to have you here. I will ask everyone to open their chips now. <laughs> so, and unwrap your sandwiches. Um, yes, thank you, that's a good idea. Um, and while you do so, I will uh, introduce um, our keynote speaker for the day. We're very proud to uh, be featuring uh, Dr. Eugene Fischel, who's Deputy Director in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research at the U.S. Department of State. Most recently, he served as the Bureau's Senior Advisor for Emerging Threats. He has uh, held a variety of other posts, posts in the U.S. government, including Senior Advisor for Russian Malign Activities and Trends in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs. He was director for Russian, Ukrainian, and, Ukraine, uh, and Eurasian affairs at the National Security Council. He served as special advisor to the vice president uh, at the National Security Affairs, and he was assistant national intelligence officer for Russia and Eurasia at the National Intelligence Council. So extremely knowledgeable, and I had the pleasure yesterday to have dinner, to be seated at the same uh, table last night at the 30th anniversary dinner, and um, it's always impressive to discuss with someone who has real life experience and contact with policymakers, legislators. Um, and so I uh, hope that we can hear a little bit of that also during the lecture. Uh, Dr. Fischel also worked at embassies in Kyiv and Minsk. He taught at George Washington University's Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies and at Georgetown's University's Wash School for uh, Foreign Service. He has completed a mid-career fellow program at Harvard's Ukrainian Research Institute and the Senior Executives in National and International Security Program at the Kennedy School at Harvard. And prior to joining the Department of State in 1991, he was a research fellow at the Institute for the Study of Conflict, Ideology, and Policy. Dr. Fischel holds degrees in political science, international relations, national security strategy, and public policy, and he is a distinguished fellow at George Mason's University SCAR, SCAR or School of Policy and Government. Last but not least, he's the author of the book, The Moscow Factor, U.S. Policy Towards Sovereign Ukraine and the Kremlin. Uh, it was published by uh, the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, and it is distributed by Harvard University Press. Uh, we're lucky to have him with us today to talk about uh, the war in Ukraine and its various implications. So please join me in offering a very warm welcome to Dr. Uh, Jean Fischel. Thank you, Jean. Greetings, everyone. It's a real honor to be here. Thank you for joining. <clears throat> and uh, Professor Zbrzycki, uh, thank you so much for that generous introduction. I very much appreciate it. And for actually making the connection uh, in terms of this program and this event. I'm very happy to be included in this celebration. Before I say anything else, you, you heard the, the background, I should point out that I'm here speaking in my academic capacity, not my official capacity. That way, perhaps, we can have a more fulsome uh, conversation about the various aspects, including uh, some of the domestic developments here that pertain to Ukraine uh, as well. At last night's event, several speakers uh, took advantage uh, of the anniversary to talk about the world as it was 30 years ago. I thought they did a fabulous job, uh, brought, brought us back in time, and underscored also how much has changed in the 30 years. I'll do the same with your forbearance, if I may, just very briefly. Uh, 30 years ago, of course, we were past the uh, first Iraq war. We were already past the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, the history was supposed to end, as someone said uh, at one point. Uh, it certainly did not. Uh, I believe the Yugoslav wars of succession were, were already raging uh, at the time. Uh, there was also, because we don't want to necessarily focus just on Europe, uh, the, uh, important developments happened elsewhere. There was something called the Battle of Mogadishu, which I believe occurred on the 3rd and 4th of October uh, 30 years ago, in which we lost some service members uh, in Somalia. 
But there was something else that happened on the 3rd and 4th of October 30 years ago, very close to today's date. Uh, and that was uh, something that has significant consequences for the world that we know today, but especially in the region that we're focusing on in this particular uh, conversation. Uh, on October 3rd, uh, you, may, you might remember if you're following the region at the time, there was fighting uh, at the Astankino uh, TV tower broadcast center uh, in Moscow. Approximately two dozen people were killed. Also that same day, President Yeltsin, the first president of post-Soviet Russia, uh, uh, declared a state of emergency. And the next day, Russian tanks fired on the Russian parliament uh, in scenes that were uh, quite captivating, uh, to say the least. Uh, among other things, those developments gave us some insight into the state of Russia's democracy, perhaps at its peak uh, at, at that time. We can discuss that if, if, uh, if you would like. Uh, if anything, the world has become more complex since then over the past uh, three decades and more unpredictable in a number of ways. It's important to have both global perspective, of course, on developments, but also strong regional understanding. It's uh, the tension between the two that's, uh, that's challenging uh, both in academic context, but also in policy context as well. Uh, crises, by the way, at least in my experience, put a premium on granular knowledge, on deep and granular knowledge. <clears throat> now, this institute, I, I have to say a few words about the institute, of course, and I was already uh, fortunate enough to be here yesterday uh, for yesterday's event, so I heard wonderful things uh, about it. But this institute continues to deliver uh, on that challenge of educating uh, both from the perspective of global issues but also a granular regional knowledge through its 17 centers and programs, if I got the number correctly. There, yeah, very good, thank you. Thank you, Professor Gallagher. Uh, 17 institutes, uh, 17 uh, centers and programs in the process providing the University of Michigan community with the knowledge, tools, and experience to become informed and active global citizens. That's from your mission statement uh, that, that I read through. Uh, very important undertaking. The preceding panel, I have to point out, certainly fit the bill in that uh, regard. It was terrific in a number of ways and very educational, and I learned a lot. So thank you uh, to, to the presenters uh, from that. The Reckoning Project has a critical mission and role, as you heard. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to know some of the other individuals involved in it, like Peter Pomerantsev, uh, Natalia Huminyuk, and some others as well, really terrific people who are, uh, who are engaged in this worthwhile, worthwhile effort. I should also mention the Sunflower Network, uh, because I came across that actually in one of the, uh, in one of the publications as well. I suspect there's no one here from, from, uh, from that organization, but they do terrific work uh, trying to assist Ukrainians in dire straits. Uh, I believe uh, former and maybe current University of Michigan students are involved in that, and it's really a terrific demonstration of, of um, uh, really caring by doing, uh, which is so important, uh, especially in a, in a crisis like that. Now, in terms of my own presentation here, I was asked to talk about the present and future of U.S. affairs in Eastern Europe. Uh, my definition of Eastern Europe is perhaps a little different than uh, folks may use in, uh, in the academic setting, because I do spend a lot of time working for the U.S. government. In our understanding, Eastern Europe uh, includes countries like Belarus, Moldova, and Ukraine, not the old Eastern Europe of Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Hungary, for, uh, for example. And because we're talking about my definition of Eastern Europe, if I may say so, uh, I've chosen to focus on what uh, Francois-Marie Arouet, also known as Voltaire, uh, to most people called, quote, a land of Europe unknown to Europe. It is the largest country entirely in Europe. It is therefore the biggest variable, both literally and figuratively, uh, in the Intermarium, the area between the Baltic and the Black Seas, it is what Sherm Garnett from that other school down the road, I believe in East Lansing, I, can I reference it? Yeah. Uh, in East Lansing, uh, called the keystone in the arch of Central and East European security, and he did so back in the mid-1990s. So not too long after this institute was, uh, was founded. It is a country that gave up the third largest nuclear arsenal at the time, 1,700 uh, nuclear weapons, some missiles, some, uh, some um, uh, air-launched, in return for something called security assurances. We can talk about that if you like uh, as well. I'm told security assurances, the lawyers are very uh, quick to point out that security assurances are not security guarantees, but I always, my retort is, but they're not nothing either. 
so something to consider uh, as well. It's a country that is today, at this moment, fighting for all of us, not just for itself. Something to keep in mind, too. I'm here, as you can tell by now, to talk about Ukraine. You can also see it on the, uh, uh, on the slide there. And it's ongoing brutalization by Putin's Russia. I would like to do so. Let's see if this works. Ah, yes, that was the shelling in, in Moscow that I referred to earlier. I would like to do so uh, by addressing four key points here. Where the war stands, how it got to this point, the short version. Uh, there's a, there are many centuries one could uh, spend discussing here. Where it is likely to go and what's at stake. The what's at stake aspect is especially important because so much depends on framing. Understanding what's truly at stake, and uh, some of this is debatable, of course, but framing is important to understand what's at stake and recognizing what's at stake is important in terms of resourcing and addressing the problem. <clears throat> First, let's consider where the war stands. And at this point, we're almost 20 months into this large-scale invasion by, uh, by Russia of Ukraine. From my perspective, at least, the war is a generational event, no less than a generational event, really, with global import and impact. It is the largest armed clash in the center of Europe since World War II. I emphasize the center of Europe because we, there are folks, and this, this august crowd knows better, but there are folks who think of Europe as the EU and, and the EU as Europe and neglect a big chunk of Europe that's not currently in the EU. So I emphasize again the geographic center of Europe. Putin's Russia has laid bare its imperialist essence during the conduct of this war. Uh, Putin's, uh, Putin has engaged in a number of miscalculations. I'll highlight just three here, uh, if I may. Hope you can see the slides uh, from the back as well. Uh, one was Putin's, well, he tried to read uh, Ukraine, the West, and the United States especially, and he's arguably misread uh, those particular actors. He also misread apparently his own military. <laughs> He thought that the Russian military was up to the task. It has demonstrated that it's rather hollow in a number of ways. He, he was expected that the Ukrainians would not fight. They have fought back and then some. He projected that the West would not support Ukraine. The West has stepped up and has generally held together. That's an, that's an ongoing question. It comes with an asterisk. And we can discuss that as well. Uh, key Russian objectives have not been reached. Uh, I'll put together some of them on a, uh, on a slide here. There, this is not, a, it's more of an art form than a science because Putin keeps talking about various objectives at different times depending on the moment and the challenge at hand. Let me talk, uh, talk about a few of these. Uh, these include some ludicrous ones, uh, especially, well, there are a number of them there, but starting with, with the first two, let me expand uh, on these if you don't mind. Demilitarization is essentially a, a, uh, a demand that Ukraine not be able to defend itself. That it has to, it's a country it's in the center of Europe that is sovereign, not under any embargo or any under, uh, other uh, international limitation, should not have the ability to, uh, to defend itself. Uh, that's one objective. Denazification, it's a, it's a strange one in a number of ways, of course. As you no doubt uh, realize, uh, we can spend some time talking about it if you like, but I'd like to leave that for the Q&A if possible. All I'll just say is that my reading of Putin's uh, denazification demand uh, actually has to do with his unwillingness to accept that the Ukrainian people have a, have a right to decide U their country's future and that nationally conscious Ukrainians uh, should not be in charge of, of that, he would say, territory. Uh, that's what denazification means, as far as I can tell. Protection of the Donbass is another uh, 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 head scratcher of, a, of an excuse, of a demand, uh, and that is uh, essentially comes down to uh, Putin suggesting that Russia needs to protect something called the people of the Donbass uh, against Ukraine, even though the Donbass is part of, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, we're getting a little closer to some real, uh, real objectives here, NATO and missiles. Uh, if you may recall, uh, at the time of uh, Putin's announcement of the large-scale invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February 2022, he talked about the threat of NATO missiles against Russia. 
Uh, if you've been following the news in terms of NATO expansion, you now know that Finland is a member of NATO. And just out of curiosity, I, I, I actually looked at a map and tried to measure the dis relative distances. And it turns out that the closest part of Finland is actually closer to Moscow than the closest part of Ukraine. Uh, so the uh, sort of NATO and missiles, uh, uh, the, to the extent that this was a serious uh, uh, objective, Putin has not exactly covered himself in glory in this, re uh, in this uh, respect as well. From my reading of it, and I would certainly be happy to hear your, your views as well, Putin has one specific Ukraine-related objective, and that's Ukraine's subjugation. The destruction of Ukraine as an independent political actor. Behind all of that, is a, is a broader objective, and that is regime preservation. And we can, we'll get into some of these aspects, uh, so I'll, I'll expand on this later as well. In the meantime, Putin has tasted defeat. Uh, he's tasted defeat when his army was forced to leave Kyiv Oblast, Chernihiv, Sumy, much of Kharkiv, part of Zhitomir, by the way, people forget about Zhitomir sometimes. Um, so he has tasted defeat, that's very important. Uh, in fact, I, I just listed some oblasts of Ukraine. <clears throat> Russia has been ejected from as many Ukrainian regions as it currently holds. That should give you uh, some insight into the trend of the war uh, at this point. In fact, Crimea uh, is the only Ukrainian region that, that is entirely under Russian occupation at this point. The Russians have not even been able to grab all of Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts uh, to almost 20 months into the large-scale invasion. Speaking of Crimea, Putin has put the occupied peninsula back on the map and back on the table, if you will. Uh, let me, I think I have a slide to this effect here. So that slide is not blank by, by mistake. It's meant to be blank. There were no strikes on Russian targets in Crimea prior to the large scale uh, invasion. Uh, since then, and these are just the most uh, obvious ones, there have been regular strikes on Russian controlled airfields warehouses, one of my favorites, the Black Sea Fleet Headquarters, uh, some of the ships in dry dock in Sevastopol, another airfield, and another airfield, all on the Crimean, uh, all on the Crimean Peninsula. In fact, in terms of the Black Sea Fleet, Russia has recently had to move 14 of its ships, surface uh, combatants, to a port in Russia because it can no longer sustain them in Sevastopol because of the Ukrainian attacks. Also not something that Putin probably intended uh, to accomplish as part of this large-scale invasion. Putin at this point is losing to someone whom he tried to denigrate as, as an actor or even a, as a clown, uh, probably uh, referencing President Zelensky's previous, uh, uh, previous work on uh, Quartal 95 and also uh, his sh uh, show, Servant of the People. Maybe some of you have watched it or not. It's uh, fascinating in a number, uh, a number of ways. But the reality is that Zelensky, he's not perfect by any means, and that's, I'm not trying to suggest that here, uh, Zelensky has become a top-notch wartime leader of Ukraine uh, in ways that were, frankly, unimaginable uh, just 20 months ago. He's someone with whom I've uh, spoken a couple of times and I've seen an amazing transformation in terms of his understanding of Ukraine's role in the region, his level of Ukrainian uh, uh, consciousness, national consciousness uh, uh, as well. Again, not trying to uh, make anything out of him beyond what evidence will, uh, will bear. Ukraine has, in the meantime, truly emerged as a keystone in the arch uh, of regional security, as Sherm Garnett put previously. Uh, Putin has had to adjust to a longer war than expected. He's had to engage in a mobilization uh, that has brought in essentially uh, at least 300 plus thousand Russian civilians into the military to replace uh, the loss of the regular Russian army, much of which at this point is dead. Uh, this, uh, I'm talking about the ground forces here, not the Air Force or the Navy necessarily. Um, Thereby, by the way, speaking of demilitarization, accomplishing perhaps more in terms of Russia's demilitarization uh, than Ukraine's. Ongoing process, obviously, but the Russian losses especially have been uh, horrific. Uh, approaching 300,000 uh, if, you, if you count uh, dead and uh, badly wounded. 
at this point. Ukrainian losses have also been significant, though a fraction, uh, a fraction of that. Despite the losses, Putin is not serious about negotiations. In fact, he's doubling down on his demands vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. He's clearly hoping that the West and Ukraine will blink first. Uh, his overall objective remains the same, and that is destruction of Ukraine and Ukrainians. Uh, since uh, in the, pre in the uh, previous panel there was a question about genocide. I wanted to mention that uh, as well. And when I say destruction, I mean destruction. This is not a, a war some t somewhere in the margins. The destruction has been uh, horrific. So there's some pictures here that you may be familiar with in some of the cities that are, and towns that unfortunately have been in the news for all the wrong uh, reasons, uh, just hellish uh, urban landscapes in Bakhmut, Mariupol, of course, Marinka, it's near Donetsk, Vuhledar in western Donetsk Oblast. These are residential buildings. These are not military bases or airfields or anything else. Kharkiv, of course, where a third of the city in the northern part of the city has been utterly destroyed. Kherson, and Andrivka, a small village, uh, but essentially it's gone. Just want to give you an idea of, uh, of what it looks like, what, what the Russian world looks like uh, after it uh, invades and, ha and has to be uh, expelled. Uh, and what I wanted to point out, by the way, in the context of these uh, settlements, because there are others I could uh, point, point to as well, in Kiev Oblast, Bucha, Irpin, uh, a few other places, the ones I chose to, uh, to put up here on the slides are all places where majority of residents were Russian speakers. So people who are naturally, through cultural connection or some other sort of part of the imagined community of Russians beyond the borders of Russia, let's say, to one extent or, or another. These are the people whose homes he has destroyed. And I would argue, and this will manifest itself probably in the years down the road, that this is another major miscalculation by Putin at this, uh, at this point. Uh, appalling human rights violations. I'm not going to dwell on this aspect because I think we, we got a real taste of it uh, in the previous uh, panel, but I know some folks uh, came in, uh, came for this event, so I'll mention just a few uh, unfortunate categories. Um, mass and unlawful killings, including summary executions, forced disappearances, degrading treatment, outright torture, sexual violence, of course, severe restrictions on, on uh, political and civil rights, that goes without saying, in some ways, unfortunately. Uh, freedom of expression, assembly, religion, etc. cetera. Um, there were horrific things that the Russians did in northern Kyiv Oblast. I'll put up a few pictures, I apologize. I, mean, I tried to find images that are not as graphic as some others. Uh, but you can see corpses lying in the, in the streets. This individual, I remember when this story broke, this individual was simply riding the bicycle down his, the street of his town, and the Russian, uh, the Russian personnel there gunned him down. You don't need to be a specialist on, on war crimes uh, to look at this image and understand what, what, it, what it represents. <clears throat> there have been really horrific exclamations uh, throughout the formerly occupied areas remind me of some things that I thought we would never see, especially in the context of World War II and some of the things that both the Nazi Germans and the Soviets uh, did to those who opposed them. Just really uh, mass burial sites uh, throughout Kharkiv Oblast. I'm sure they'll find many such sites in Kherson as well when it's liberated and a few other, uh, a few other places. <clears throat> There's also the issue, of course, of the removal of Ukrainian children, which should not be forgotten for obvious reasons. It's a particularly gall galling, appalling, sensitive one. Uh, and it could be an aspect, those who of, you, of you who are more familiar with the uh, Genocide Convention, it could be considered an aspect of genocide as well, especially when the children are removed and essentially re-educated and turned into someone else, away from, the, uh, from their nation and their culture. Uh, the ICC ruling, International Criminal Court ruling against Putin, is especially important in this regard in the context of reminding folks that even the high and mighty or the supposedly high and mighty of this world uh, uh, will be held accountable. 
Putin at this point is an indicted war criminal, and his ability to, uh, to travel is rather limited, which is important. Now, the genocidal aspects that I'm referencing here, by the way, would not be the first time that Russia of one stripe or another tried to commit genocide uh, in Ukraine. I'm sure you're familiar with something called the Holodomor, uh, death by starvation. Murder by starvation is perhaps a more, a more apt uh, uh, translation that the Soviet regime carried out in the early 30s, killing mil millions of Ukrainians. Purposeful killing very much fits the definition of genocide. Don't take my word for it, of course. The individual who coined the term, Raphael Lemkin, actually called Holodomor a prime example of Soviet genocide. I believe that's an actual, that's an actual quote. In any event, then and arguably now, Russia is attempting to erase uh, uh, Ukrainians as a people. And that's not surprising because Putin, in some ways, uh, has implicated himself. If you read the July uh, article that came out under his name, at least, uh, July 2021, I should say, he essentially argued that there's no such thing as, a, as Ukrainian people. Russians and Ukrainians are the same. So he, he provided the ideological underpinning for potential genocide, uh, genocidal actions then. Speaking of genocide, I have to mention the Crimean Tatar people, the indigenous people of the, of the Crimean Peninsula, the largest there are others, the largest uh, indigenous people of the Crimean Peninsula who experienced genocide, uh, certainly from my personal perspective, uh, when they were forcibly removed uh, to Central Asia from the Crimean Peninsula at the end of World War II, as World War II was wrapping up. At least a third of them, if I remember correctly, don't quote me on that particular aspect, uh, died along the way. Uh, arguably, uh, arguably fits the definition of genocide as well. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Crimean Tatar people specifically. Now, there have been some unintended con consequences uh, for Putin. I would like to highlight a few of these. <clears throat> You're welcome to look at the slide. Of course, I'll expand as necessary. Russia, arguably, today is less secure than it was before it launched the large-scale invasion. I mentioned the ships that Putin has had to already relocate from occupied Crimea. I mentioned the fact that the Russian professional army is mostly dead at this point. Um, Finland is, an, uh, is uh, in NATO. Sweden, hopefully, will follow formally uh, soon. Uh, it's not something that points to Russia actually being more secure uh, at this point. Ukraine is much more unified than arguably ever before. Uh, public opinion, opinion surveys, and they, uh, public opinion surveys always come with a grain of salt. Uh, they reflect not what people think necessarily, uh, but what they say. But in the Ukrainian context, as opposed to the Russian context, it's difficult for, to me to imagine that the real numbers are all that different from what uh, is actually uh, expressed. Amazing unity uh, in terms of fighting back amazing unity in terms of uh, not accepting concessions, including territorial concessions, and an amazing unity in terms of fighting for, for as long as it takes to push the Russian aggressor uh, out of Ukraine. We talked about NATO and the uh, sort of uh, NATO growing, reinvigorated, has a new mission, thanks to Mr. Putin, a uh, new old mission, that is territorial defense, something that uh, the alliance was uh, sort of lost track of at some point, became much more expeditionary with, let's say, mixed results, uh, but now is again focused on expanding the core of democracies in the, in the uh, transatlantic space. Loss of influence of Ukraine, that almost goes without saying, but I'd like to point out that the reason why Putin had to use the military, st uh, military tool of statecraft is because uh, he could no longer influence Ukraine in other ways. It's in some ways an admission of defeat. That might be convoluted logic, so please consider that uh, uh, before you dismiss it uh, out of hand. Uh, there's, uh, he's also lost uh, influence elsewhere, including in Central Asia, among countries that he probably f falsely considered to be allies. Russia has no allies. I'd like to hear you push back maybe on Belarus or maybe some Iran. We can, we, can have that. Uh, we can have that conversation, but definitely loss of influence. Just look at what's happening in Armenia. Uh, at this point, Russia could not help protect Armenia, a member of, of a, uh, it's a treaty member, uh, it's a CSTO treaty member, uh, Collective Security Treaty Organization is, the, uh, is what CSTO stands for, in which Russia plays a dominant role. 
could not help, could not come to Armenia's defense. From the Armenian perspective, I know there's a, there's a comp complex territorial issue there with Azerbaijan. A growing dependence on the PRC. Russia has been a junior partner to, uh, to the PRC for some time. A reversal from the from, uh, earlier period when the USSR existed, where, where the PRC was very much the junior partner independent on Russia, and there were all kinds of difficulties, of course, in that relationship. And I predict there will be again in the future, uh, I think for rather obvious reasons, but a growing dependence uh, that uh, will come at Russia's uh, expense uh, in, the, in the years and decades to come. And it's a regime now, the Putin regime, that has staked its future on the outcome of this unprovoked war. Uh, it, it could mean a number of things down the road for the regime, but I suspect when the Putin regime falls over X number of years, I don't want to I certainly be here, stand here and predict a particular, a particular date, I suspect the outcome of the ongoing war will, pro, uh, will figure prominently in that particular dynamic. Uh, let me move along because we have, I want to cover a few other points uh, as well. Second part, you will see some, uh, you will not, I didn't put them on slides because I didn't want to uh, uh, frighten you in terms of what detail I will, I will uh, uh, get into. Uh, but let's just say, let me say in terms of the second part, how we got here, um, I have to state for, uh, for, uh, from the beginning, Putin is the one individual most responsible for what is happening today, Russia's ongoing war against Ukraine. Putin's personality is a particular one. He's anchored in the late Soviet period. He's president of Russia, but he's, he's a uh, person from the late Soviet period. Under him, Russia has become even more revisionist and, and uh, neo-imperial. Uh, frankly, he gave us a heads up about his potential behavior in 2003. That's the that's why I have the map of the Kerch Strait there with the uh, island of, of Tuzla. It's a tiny speck of land on which uh, uh, one of the supports of the illegal Kerch Strait Bridge uh, uh, now stands. It's a Ukrainian island that the Russians tried to take over in 2003. If you didn't hear about this, if you're, if you're not aware of that particular crisis, you, uh, it's completely understandable. Most of the Western press missed it, didn't think it was that important. It was hugely important. Putin was already testing Ukraine at that point. And to give former President Kuchma credit, and I don't say that combination of words often, by the way, <laughs> uh, uh, he did push back and the Russians uh, had to back away. Now, Putin has been trying to have his way uh, with Ukraine since 2014. The war did not start in 2022. It's a large-scale invasion. The war has been going on for nine plus uh, years at, the point, at, at this point. And again, for Putin, regime preservation is the key objective. Ukraine is a, is, a, is, a, is a place where some of this plays out. The reason why he dislikes Ukraine especially, and books have been written and more can be written on, the, on that subject, uh, perhaps, is that Ukraine is a bad model, bad in quotes, bad model for the rest of the post-Soviet region because Ukrainians actually believe that they should be able to influence where their country is heading and that what the people want matters. He doesn't want that uh, in Russia, certainly. Uh, I will skip, I was going to say something about the uh, Kievan Rus period, but I won't. Suffice it to say that it's a, it's a no matter how, how far back that period is at this point, it's very important now because of Putin's manipulation of history. Almost everything he says about history is a historical, and on a number of levels. We won't delve in, into those now, but I just wanted to, uh, to underscore that. And I believe Sophia mentioned in the previous uh, panel that she, she took Russian history courses but not, didn't study Ukraine. Uh, I'll, I'll respond with this. Uh, uh, I'll say that you did study Ukraine just in a very convoluted, perverted way, <laughs> uh, the way that early Russian history uh, uh, is presented. And I know, I know you realize that, uh, certainly. Uh, at this point, uh, Russia, when it comes to the Kievan Rus period and other aspects of Ukrainian history, Russia has carried out a, uh, a sort of a large-scale, industrial-scale cultural misappropriation uh, of that history. And just please keep that in mind, because you'll hear references uh, to it at one time or another. Uh, I will ask you. Uh, it's a rhetorical question, uh, a question about something called the Third Rome. Uh, it's a reference that's made to Moscow, uh, the, the notion being that Rome was the first Rome, Constantinople was the second Rome, and then for some, for some reason Moscow is the third Rome. Not Kiev is the third Rome, and Moscow may be the fourth Rome. 
for me, that aspect captures the, the extent to which the Russians have attempted to rewrite uh, regional history and to take agency and influence and voice and patrimony from the people of Ukraine going back to the Kievan uh, uh, Rus period. I'll mention one date and I'll move on to the Soviet period very quickly. 22 October uh, 1721. I know there's some historians here, maybe of the region, maybe not, so that's an unfair. It's a particular date. It's a date that Peter I, not Peter the Great, even the Russians don't call him Peter the Great that often, but for some reason in, in English we refer to him as Peter the Great and Catherine the Great instead of Catherine the Second. Anyway, that's when Peter I declared the Russian Empire. 22 October 1721. Before it was what? Russia? It was Muscovy. There was no Russia in that sequence. Something to keep in mind as well. Anyway, I could say a few more, uh, a few more things I won't. Um, just in terms of the, the Soviet period, very quickly, I will just say uh, uh, that, and folks pro here probably know this, but many audiences that I speak to don't, at some point Ukraine had its independence after World War I. It was an independence that was recognized by a number of countries. Uh, and, apologies. Uh, one was Germany. The Germans were very much interested in Ukrainian independence for their own geopolitical reasons. Another was, was uh, Turkey, what we refer to as Turkey uh, today, also important in terms of the Black Sea. There were a few others, but what's, what's a big one also that recognized Ukraine's independence? Bolshevik Russia. The Bolsheviks recognized Ukraine's independence. Something to keep in mind because the Russian historiography ignores that aspect as well. We could talk about Chernobyl and uh, Gorbachev, we won't do that. I would just say that Ukraine played a key role in the USSR's collapse, and Leonid Kravchuk, the first president of modern Ukraine, played a, a key personal role as well. I only mention that because I, want to, I wanted to set up the next point, and that is that the collapse of the USSR is still ongoing. So legally, technically, it ended, I believe, on December 25, 1991. It is still ongoing in many ways, and what we're seeing in the region today, including Russia's ongoing war against Ukraine, is the ebb and flow of the dynamic of the former imperial center trying to reassert itself, but doing so in ways that will, uh, will be very dangerous for itself, by the way, not just to its neighbors over the long haul. Who was the first Russian president to question Ukraine's borders? It wasn't Putin, it was Yeltsin. Something to keep in mind, uh, in mind too. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, Ukrainian leaders have played a role in, in what is transpiring today as well. Ukraine's leadership has failed, and uh, post-Soviet leadership has failed in a number of ways. People, people talk about corruption and other, and other such ills, which are certainly, which are still present, to one extent uh, or another. But Ukraine's post-Soviet leaders, and I refer to them, I refer to the Ukrainian elite as actually a post-Soviet elite, whereas I refer to the civil society as Ukrainian civil society. I do that for for a reason. Ukraine's post-Soviet leaders uh, failed to foresee that at some point Russia would attempt to extinguish Ukraine's independence. They failed to foresee it, uh, maybe because they were focusing on wealth accumulation, maybe because they were themselves Soviet-era products and couldn't imagine that happening. There may be a number of reasons why they did that, but certainly Ukraine's leaders have contributed uh, to what we're seeing today. The West did as well. Western ambivalence and ambiguity about the east of the continent uh, has emboldened Moscow in a number of ways. Uh, the inability to understand that there is a security deficit in the east of the continent that needs to be filled has contributed to that uh, to these dynamics uh, as well. Nature abhors a vacuum, and there is there is a security vacuum centered on Ukraine uh, today. Let me say a few words about the U.S. and I'll begin to wrap up um, because the our country here, for those of you who are American has also contributed, and in fact, every administration, every U.S. administration has contributed to this dynamic, um, and not in the way that Moscow alleges. The Moscow uh, trope is that uh, Washington is a sort of puppet master uh, controlling things in the region. That's not it at all. Um, the current administration, you might think I, I would not include it in this, in this uh, uh, category, the current administration uh, has been terrific in terms of sending, uh, providing support to Ukraine, both financial and military, uh, and deserves a lot of credit, though that support has often been uh, timid and long in coming. Uh, for example, only this week did the President, did the White House uh, announce that the President will deliver a speech on, on why it's important to support Ukraine. 
almost 20 months uh, into the war. Uh, why did it take this long? That's a rhetorical question. Uh, but before this administration, apologies, uh, before this administration supported, provided support to Ukraine, there was also something called the spirit of Geneva. Let's see if you have a, yes, that was the president meeting with President Putin in which they talked about creating relations with Russia that will be stable and predictable. That's a, that's a, uh, that's a quote. The notion that someone could expect Putin, who has made his name as a disruptor in many ways, but that would, someone like that would sign up to a st stable and predictable relationship with the United States is laughable, of course. Uh, there was the Trump administration, uh, a particular and peculiar case in its own right. Uh, I sort of, I'm remind, I selected a picture, image of the Helsinki summit because it was actually a low point in, in many ways in diplomatic history uh, in the sense that our then president could not explain uh, our differences with Russia over Crimea to such an extent that Putin actually felt the need to step in and, and, uh, and help him out with what the with, you know, how, how our views are, are different on the peninsula. <clears throat> there was the Obama administration, of course, uh, kept moving goalposts in terms of supporting Ukraine, never ended up not providing any lethal assistance to Ukraine, even though Russia was already fighting a war uh, against that country. President Obama claimed that there were no core interests involved. I suspect President Biden, when he delivers the, the speech, uh, will, will beg to differ in that regard this time around. Uh, in fact, President Obama called Ukraine a client state of Russia, and he did so in his uh, State of the Union address. I forgot which year it was, uh, but also a misreading of the situation. And of course, the Obama administration was responsible for the failed reset policy. Uh, yeah, that's uh, Secretary Clinton and uh, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov pressing the so-called uh, reset button. Uh, if you, those of you who read Russian, <laughs> remember that it was it was mislabeled as Pirigruska, which is overload, as opposed to Pirigruska, which is reset. But uh, uh, maybe it was. Close enough. Um, you saw, uh, you remember President Bush looking into Putin's eyes and, so, and seeing something, uh, something good there. Um, I should point out that, the, that uh, the Bush administration, Bush 43 administration, did support the Orange Revolution. Uh, became a major uh, cheerleader for the, for the Orange Revolution. But it never blamed Russia for what had transpired. And Russia was involved in, of course, uh, in the fraudulent uh, attempted election at that point. Uh, Clinton administration, uh, you remember that uh, period. Ukraine's interests were, were uh, uh, dismissed and subsumed, even though Yeltsin was the first Russian president to question Ukraine's territorial integrity. But we were overly focused on Yeltsin. Um, and then, of course, there was the, oh, sorry, how could I forget? Yeltsin was also responsible for bringing that individual into power, which is why we're having this conversation uh, today. Uh, and, of course, there was the uh, uh, Bush 41 and Yeltsin, and before that, Bush 41 and Gorbachev. Uh, that particular picture is important because one of Putin's key claims about the United States uh, is that the United States sought the collapse of the USSR. Uh, as someone who went through the archives, uh, in, in great detail, I can assure you there's nothing there to point, that points to that, uh, uh, to that notion at all. In fact, uh, Bush 41 worked very hard to preserve the USSR so that Gorbachev could remain uh, in, in, uh, in power. Something to keep in mind as well. Yet another a historical claim uh, by, uh, by uh, Putin. Let me skip ahead. I was going to talk a little bit about the cultural familiarity with Russia, quote-unquote Russia, which, which uh, uh, tended to use USSR and Russia interchangeably, which is, which is part of the uh, problem that we face um, uh, in understanding the region. Even as recently as last year, the, the Biden administration put out a, a, a press release which talked about the, uh, the US space race with Russia even though, of course, it was the Soviet Union. And even though, and some of you may know this, the father of the Soviet space program was, was who? Do you remember? Sergei Korolev, a uh, Ukrainian. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind uh, as well. Um, let me skip ahead to where we go from here very quickly. Yeah, those are the variables. Uh, some of them will sound familiar to you because we've we touched on them already. 
Putin is clearly committed to staying the course. He cannot withdraw from Ukraine at this point. That's part of uh, that's his own doing. Uh, he thinks he can get away with it because the Russians so far have been pliant, uh, uh, domestically, so far at least. Uh, Ukraine's will to fight and capacity to resist. Will it remain strong? I suspect so. A part of it, but only a part of it, will depend on the success of the current counteroffensive, which is a dif uh, difficult slog to be sure. But as President Zelensky pointed out, and as do other uh, Ukrainians, including activists, this is not just about territory, it's about people, safeguarding people. Degree and scope of Western support and consistency therein, another important key variable. My hope, my, my personal hope, is that we'll continue to decolonize our regional policy, not focus on Russia so much. Now that's, by the way, that should be, uh, that goes hand in hand with decolonization of curricula. Uh, at universities and understanding that there are other countries in the region and just, just calling something Slavic but focusing on Russia is not, uh, is not necessarily sufficient. That's a personal statement, not, not designed to call anyone out on, uh, at all. But you need to deco decolonize uh, curricula because uh, you need to have uh, people who can come to the fore in the future in terms of the, uh, pursuing the right policies. There are also broader international perceptions not enough of the world sees Ukraine's war against Ukraine as a war of de uh, as a decolonization effort. I've talked to officials, relatively senior officials in Africa and Asia and elsewhere, who don't believe uh, that one European country could be considered a colonizer of another. Which I won't label what that what that points to uh, to in my mind. I'll just say that that's that's a gross distortion. The first empires were, of course, land empires, not overseas empires. Uh, and then finally, degree and scope of Ukraine's transformation. My hope is that the war, this current war is a watershed moment. Uh, civil society in Ukraine is more robust than ever. Uh, but a return to business as usual is still, unfortunately, at least theoretically, possible. And that needs to be, uh, that cannot allow, be allowed to happen. Finally, and this is, I'll end with this because I know we're pressed for time at this point. Um, there's a growing realization at, uh, in terms of what's at stake. This is the fourth and, and final section. The future of Ukraine, of course, of Ukraine, the largest country in Europe, is important by itself. But there's also the issue of the international rules-based order that we have to consider and whether it applies to Russia. Moscow has behaved since the collapse of the USSR as though not just the international rules-based order, but the laws of physics don't apply in the former Soviet space. That cannot be allowed. Uh, there's the issue of the, uh, of the principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity, pretty self-explanatory in terms of the importance. There's the potential perception by other would-be aggressors, including the PRC, in terms of whether the, Ru whether the Russians will be able to get away uh, with this current aggression or not. You see the other points there uh, as well. Uh, the emergence of New Eastern Europe is a particular uh, focus uh, of mine. Uh, still perceived by many as the Western tier of the former USSR rather than New Eastern Europe. That probably needs to change. I referenced Russia's potential transformation, uh, and uh, in my view, you know, the longer this persists, the more cataclysmic it could be uh, in the future. I say that because the Russian Federation is an empire. It's still an empire. There was this uh, perception before that there was an outer empire in the former Warsaw uh, uh, bloc inner empire in terms of the union, so-called Union Republics uh, within the Soviet Union, but I say the Russian Federation is the internal empire uh, at this point, and the Russian leadership would be much better served if it focused on Russia's internal problems uh, than trying to um, invade other countries. There are other global uh, considerations. You, you see them referenced. Non-proliferation. Ukraine gave up nukes. Uh, if, uh, if Ukraine fails, if Ukraine is absorbed by Russia, uh, what do you think that will do to the perception of the importance of nuclear weapons in the world? There will be a, a, a rush to proliferate. Food security, I think, is obvious, considering what the Russians are doing uh, in the Black Sea. And the issue of piracy is also closely related. The Russians have no right to intervene with international shipping in the Black Sea. There's no embargo against Ukraine, and there's not even a war declaration. Russia never declared war on Ukraine. It's a so-called special military operation. So what uh, the Russian Navy is engaging in as we speak in the Black Sea is piracy, certainly from my personal perspective. And of course, there's the question of accountability, its perceptions and lessons learned, 
That's why the Reckoning pro uh, Project is so important and other projects like it. I think I'll uh, stop here. Uh, I could go on for a while, but I don't want to do that to you. I just want to say that I'm looking forward very much to the Copernicus Foundation event uh, on Monday, celebrating the 50th year, 50 years of Polish studies at Michigan, if I understand correctly. Uh, and I also wanted to take advantage of that reference to remind you that while the Berlin Wall uh, was the final, last domino to fall, it was Poland that played a crucial role uh, that led up to that moment. Poland was crucial then, Ukraine is crucial today. I'll stop right there and I very much look forward to your questions. Are folks supposed to go to the microphones? Is that, is that the idea? Okay. Hello. Greetings. Uh, my name is Ksenia Yurtaeva, and I'm a scholar at risk fellow in the Advisor Center of Europe in Russia, and I'm an associate professor of Harkin National University of Internal Affairs. Uh, thank you for your very insightful talk and highlighting all these important questions. Uh, and I just wanted to make a bridge between uh, our previous panel and your talk. Uh, we talked about uh, the very high stakes that Ukraine is paying for this war for resistance, uh, that uh, Ukraine uh, is really uh, putting up his people and its uh, effort to uh, resist, and about the importance to uh, stop Putin's imperial project that is still on the slide. And I just have like two questions. Uh, what, in your opinion, uh, is uh, international community and uh, other countries like United States, is, uh, do you think its support is at this point is enough at their political, diplomatic, and also in the military field, because we understand each of this field in each way is very important, uh, because even in Valdai Forum that is taking place like recently, and uh, uh, Putin is uh, told that he's challenging the international order, so basically he's throwing their uh, uh, stake or their all international order right now. Do you think this, uh, uh, support is enough. And another question, of course, it would be your personal understanding of this, uh, like of this question. But what, how do you see the liability of the high-rank officials of the Russian Federation? Because it's, of course, the question is very tough. But I would like to hear your thoughts about it. Thank you. Well, thank you for those questions. Really appreciate it. Um, in terms of support being enough, uh, I, I, I would suggest that that needs to be understood in the context of what the objective is what the outcome sought is. The Ukrainian people have been very clear in terms of what they hope to achieve, and that is the, the withdrawal of Russian troops from all Ukrainian territory, including Crimea. Uh, of course, that has not happened. Ukraine is engaged in a very tough uh, slog of a counteroffensive, as you know, especially in the south of the country, but also uh, in the east. Uh, the Russian military is, is not particularly skilled, but it's large. Uh, and Ukraine needs additional support. So it's not, the short answer is that it's what, what has been done so far is not enough. Uh, more needs to be done. Unfortunately, Western assistance, and I'm talking about military assistance in this regard, uh, it's been coming and it's, it's been critical. In fact, I, I've reason to believe that it played a, a, a key role in defeating the Russian forces in northern Kiev Oblast at the very beginning of the large scale uh, invasion where we sent uh, significant numbers of javelins and stingers. Uh, to blunt that assault, but it's not enough in this because a number of Ukrainian regions remain occupied at this point. Ukraine is also having a difficult time uh, financing itself. Uh, so the West has been providing significant assistance. Uh, it needs to continue. Uh, there's a deficit on a monthly basis. Uh, obviously, you know that uh, in the most recent uh, continuing resolution that the Congress uh, passed, there was no direct money uh, for Ukraine, uh, that has raised concerns in a number of capitals, including in Kiev. Uh, of course, uh, the hope is that, uh, that 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 particular type of support, the financial support, will continue as well. But no, overall, it's not enough because there's still a tough fight ahead. On the question of liability of, Russia, of Russian leadership, I mean, I think it's been documented, maybe not sufficiently, depends on the bar that one uh, uh, has in mind when talking about uh, sufficient uh, evidence and documentation, but it's clear, and one doesn't have to be especially, an especially uh, well-informed legal scholar, 
uh, because of Putin, what Putin himself has said about Russia's large-scale invasion of Ukraine. He's on record saying quite a few things that, that are, in my mind, uh, exhibit A uh, in a number of ways. Uh, but you know, Russian officials, starting with Putin, have been responsible. I would include the entirety of the Security Council of the Russian Federation in that regard, because you no doubt remember that session in which Putin, that public session in which Putin called on every member of the Security Council uh, to endorse his in, his invasion plan, and they did so some more reluctantly than others. But they're certainly part of the; uh, they should be held accountable. They are liable uh, for the atrocities that are taking place on a daily basis, including today. Please. A wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. The United States has been by far the largest supplier of weapons and aid to Ukraine, but the United States has, um, Ukraine since the beginning of the war has asked for three additional things besides what we've given them. They needed hundreds of tanks, they want uh, jet planes, and they want uh, the ATACOMs, the long range missiles, and we have never really given them those things. And also to go along with that is the fact that while the United States and Germany will both say and have said many times that they don't want Ukraine to lose, neither country has ever said that they want Ukraine to win, as far as I understand. Thank you. And may I leave uh, you with uh, Slava, <laughs> Slava Ukraine. Mm. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, lose versus win. It's a key question there. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for, your, uh, for your comments and, and uh, question. Uh, yes, the Ukrainians have asked for certain categories of weapons that we have yet to provide. It's not entirely true of tanks, although one can talk, if you're talking about hundreds, that's, uh, uh, you're certainly correct in that regard. Um, other countries have stepped up in terms of uh, the Leopard tanks, certainly from Europe, in much larger numbers than we are able to provide in terms of the Abrams tank. My military colleagues tell me that the Abrams tank needs a lot of maintenance, is, uh, uses up a lot of uh, fuel, uh, and not, is not great for the East European theater. I don't know if that's entirely true or not. Uh, those are some of the explanations uh, I've heard. Uh, uh, but yes, Ukraine will need more tanks if it wants to, if it hopes to liberate more of its territory. Uh, on the aircraft front, there is some good news, as, as, as you know, because the Ukrainian pilots are being trained at this point on the F-16 one of our uh, former premier uh, air platforms. Uh, but unfortunately, and this is yet another example, and I say this in my uh, non-official capacity, of course, uh, uh, this is something that should have been done already close to a year ago, uh, not now. This linear approach, this sort of slow roll approach to helping Ukraine uh, is uh, not having uh, the kind of benefit that it could otherwise, and it's costing lives on a daily, uh, on a da daily basis. The longer range missile systems, the attackers that you referenced, the hope is that they'll, they'll be provided uh, to Ukraine, but there's been a, a multi-month delay uh, at this point, and I hope the White House will announce uh, soon that they'll, they'll, be, uh, they'll be going to Ukraine. They can be a real difference maker, as you know, con uh, given your question, uh, because when we provided, when the United States government provided HIMARS systems, it forced the Russians to move logistics bases further away from the front, which complicated Russia's efforts to react uh, to, uh, to Ukrainian counteroffensive moves. Uh, the attack comes a longer range that would complicate things even more for the Russians uh, uh, and, re and really, uh, really begin to destroy the logistics base uh, in that particular area of operations. On the lose versus win, not to lose but not necessarily to win, it's a critical question. It's one of those framing questions that's so important that leads to many other things, including resourcing. If, if our goal is to, is to prevent Ukraine from losing, it's, it's a very different outcome uh, than helping Ukraine win. Because today we can already claim that we have prevented Ukraine from losing, because it still exists 20 months uh, into this large-scale uh, Russian invasion. But that's not good enough, certainly in my, uh, in my uh, personal view. Ukraine has to win. Uh, Ukraine has to reclaim its territory, not just for Ukraine, but also, as I referenced, because of uh, many other reasons including the very notion of, of what constitutes international law and the fact that countries in the 21st century, in this case in the center of Europe, should not be able to grab other countries' territories and proclaim them their own. Thank you.
Thank you for a great lecture. My name is Vikan Maradin from the Center for Armenia Studies. Mm -hmm. um, you touched on Russia's failure to come to one of its most significant CSTO allies, Armenia's side, with the recent conflict with other Azerbaijan, and I appreciate you alluding to the namely 10-month humanitarian crisis uh, of the Azeri government blockading the Alachian Corridor, refusing to allow food, medicine, or any other humanitarian aid to this region. Recently, the self-proclaimed democratic autonomous government in the region of Nagorno-Karabakh, known to its art, uh, residents as Artsakh, officially announced that they would dissolve their government, followed by a forced mass exodus of around 100,000 Armenians out of the region. And recently, scholars have deemed this conflict as the other war or the forgotten war. Both the West and the UN's inability to step in, combined with Putin's distraction on the Ukrainian front, has caused a forced exodus as largely ignored or unreported international media compared to its coverage of Ukraine. How do you understand Russia's failed response to the situation in the Caucasus as a protector of this sphere of influence? And how much can be attributed to Russia's deficiency in comparison to the West and the UN, who also were distracted, ultimately not able to protect a democratically backed government? Thank you. You may have a future as a White House correspondent uh, with, that, with that kind of uh, question. Uh, let me just uh, 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 respond quickly. I mean, there's a lot there, obviously, in, in your question. Why Russia hasn't responded? Well, an, an obvious part of the of the of the of uh, my answer is that it's engaged heavily in Ukraine. It's one of the costs involved with Russia's uh, unprovoked attack against uh, that country. There, there, it comes with certain costs, and one of them is the inability to project its power and influence in the, uh, elsewhere. In the, in the, I hate this phrase, but I'll say in a post-Soviet uh, space. So it's another, yet another loss for Russia. It's an inability to project power, including uh, and, and protect countries uh, that are members of what's supposed to be a security alliance. So a black eye for Russia uh, in that regard. This is not the first time this happened. You may recall uh, ethnic tensions, more than tensions, unfortunately, uh, in Uzbekistan some years back, uh, involving, uh, I believe, the Kyrgyz, uh, was it the Kyrgyz uh, uh, minority, uh, the Russians, uh, uh, were supposed to come in and help out. They didn't. Uh, and uh, that was already an, an early indicator that uh, uh, Russia is, uh, is, may talk a, a better game than it can actually play. Um, in terms of the, why the others, the UN, the United States, and others have not uh, uh, stepped up and, and stepped in, without getting too much into this particular issue, uh, uh, the question here is that uh, uh, for most of the world, Karabakh, I'll use that name of it. I, I know the, uh, the Armenian name is, uh, as well, um, is generally considered a territory of Azerbaijan. So there's the issue of territorial integrity of Azerbaijan and the notion that Armenian forces, foreign forces in the context of Azerbaijan, uh, have been helping out to hold territory against the, uh, the wishes of the central government uh, in Baku. So there, there are complicating factors. I appreciate you bringing attention to, to this issue. I suspect it would probably grab more headlines, if not for Russia's ongoing war against Ukraine. But again, this is, uh, this is the context uh, that these developments are taking place in. And I have no doubt that Baku considered the, this aspect when it, when it decided to move against uh, Karabakh, that the world would be focused elsewhere. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was really excellent. Um, so I have a question. Um, because you live in D.C., you might understand the Republican Party better than I do. Um, uh oh. <laughs> I, have a, <laughs> I have a question about why the um, at least a portion of the Republican Party, particularly in the House recently, you know, more than half I think of the party voted against uh, an aid package to Ukraine. The um, what I'm what I'm confused about is the focus. Um, you know, it's really a bipartisan focus, but it's also very heavily on the Republican side, a focus on China. We have a select committee on the Chinese Communist Party that Mike Gallagher is very uh, aggressive on as the yeah. co-chair. Um, and we see Russia and China in a relationship that's not yet a full-blown alliance, but that is extremely close, and particularly the, the personal relationship between Xi Jinping and, and Putin, and the way in which they have talked about their vision for um, a new global order that marginalizes the United States. So given this closeness of Russia and China, even though China has remained somewhat restrained, um, and the focus on China, why does it seem like part of the Republican Party is actually so unsupportive of Ukraine, and perhaps, particularly around Trump, supportive of Russia? 
a small question. <laughs> Let me try to answer it this way. I appreciate. It. I do appreciate the question. Um, so first of all, I, I have dealt in various, uh, in my official capacity, without going into too much detail, um, I have certainly uh, been engaged in trying to um, underscore that uh, helping Ukraine against Russia also has the potential to help us in the, in the PRC context as well, uh, for one reason that you mentioned already, and that is the nature of the relationship between Moscow and Beijing at this point. Uh, not quite an alliance, and I'm not sure it will become that, but that's obviously it's, it's subjective to a certain extent and is debatable. I think there are many problems in that relationship that will come to the fore in the future, uh, at Russia's expense again. Um, uh, but I've had to deal with this, with this issue. There are those on the Hill included, and I do participate in briefings on the Hill uh, for various committees. Um, uh, there are those who said we need to focus on the PRC. That's the big challenge. Those who support Ukraine uh, against Russia. It's an artificial dichotomy uh, in, the, in a number of ways. Uh, if we stand up to Russia, if we help Ukraine, that is bound to help us in terms of the PRC as well, because both again, Moscow and Beijing are checking to see the extent to which we're willing to protect the current uh, international order, which is under significant uh, duress. Um, the other aspect of your question uh, could begin to unravel as a, as a citizen and as a voter. Uh, it's, a, it's, a challenging, uh, it's a challenging one. Uh, I suspect, I'll, I'll be kind and I'll, I'll say that I suspect certain folks just don't fully grasp, grasp what's at stake in Russia's ongoing war against Ukraine, why it's important. Uh, to stand up to Russia. Perhaps they undervalue European security. Maybe but they bought into the false notion that European security is only for Europeans to, uh, to worry about, uh, even though I think that our country has a significant role to play there. Uh, maybe they bought into the notion, uh, uh, into the Putinist notion that Ukraine is, quote unquote, not a real country. There are a number of explanations, all of them bad why people don't understand why, why Ukraine needs to be supported for reasons that go well beyond Ukraine, and I just only scratched the surface in this, in this talk. Um, thank you very much for this great talk, and first of all, express my support to the Ukraine and Ukrainian people, because I'm myself from Georgia, and I know what does it mean mm -hmm. to be attacked by Russia and Russian aggression twice. It was 90s when I was a kid and expelled being eth ethnically Georgian from Abkhazia, and then mm -hmm. in 2008 when we were first attacked and we had the five days war, and we went through all these brutalities. Mm -hmm. Now to the question. Um, so I'm very much interested in your opinion and your analysis because you, I assume, are also, uh, also originally from Ukraine and you know local politics um, in Ukraine and regional politics in relation to Russia and you have, uh, uh, have 30 years experience in working with the US State Department, right? So what will be first come? There will be the regime collapse in Russia and then the defeat of Russia in the Ukraine war, or vice versa. First the defeat and then the regime collapse, because whatever we are seeing uh, on the side of Russia, there is total disorientation within militaries, because there is no unified command, there is Prigozhin's mercenaries, the recently what has developed, the a coup attempted military, and successful coup. And um, on the other hand, uh, uh, what, are those disadvantages that have Ukraine uh, considering the domestic politics? We are talking a lot about foreign politics and the Western aid and what we agree and we have the consensus that the Western um, actors are quite uh, consistent in a way in terms of economic sanctions, in terms of military aid, in terms of political support unprecedented. It was not like <laughs> during Georgia-Russia war. Mm. Uh, but we also have to agree that this support should be somehow translated in a better, in an efficient way in the local politics. All international politics are local, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the actors should be receptive, well receptive, um, and more organized and mobilized. So in that sense, how you will assess the Ukrainian openness, Ukrainian readiness to translate that support effectively? 
mm -hmm. uh, against Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you asking uh, this uh, set of questions and uh, uh, wonderful to, uh, to meet you. Uh, I, I, I'm familiar with your country, at least the country that you, that you come from. Uh, and I thought that uh, our American response and the international response in general in, in, uh, uh, when Russia um, uh, most recently uh, uh, invaded Georgia was insufficient. The Bush 43 administration at that point was already nearing its timeline uh, in power and, and did very little, frankly, to push back. And then the Obama administration added insult to injury, arguably. I'm a, I'm a, a, a critic of, of various administrations, non nonpartisan certainly in that respect. Uh, the Obama administration added insult to injury by, by pursuing the reset policy with Russia while Russia was occupying Georgian uh, territory. So that was arguably that contributed to the, uh, Moscow's decision to try to annex Crimea and had its own consequences in terms of the large scale invasion as well. It's difficult to say, you know, Russia is a, uh, is a particular place. It can look pretty stable from the outside uh, until one gets into some of the sort of the specifics of the dynamics there. I mean, there are different types of stability. There's general stability as we would define it. Um, there's the stability of cemeteries, uh, stable but not something one wants to necessarily uh, be in, uh, involved in. And then there's the, um, a stability that masks uh, fragility, uh, brittleness, uh, that, uh, that is uh, a significant feature of, of, uh, of Russia, of the Russian power dynamic today. I, I don't say politics because there are no politics in Russia really uh, of any significant degree uh, at this point. Re so regime collapse before defeat or defeat and then leading to regime collapse. I can see both playing out, uh, uh, one or the other. I can see, that I can easily see how this could be in, uh, occur in parallel. Uh, a large-scale uh, defeat at the, uh, at the at the front lines, uh, accelerating maneuvering back in Moscow, uh, that uh, interferes further with Russia's ability to prosecute this illegal war, which then has other negative consequences for the battlefield. So mutually reinforcing in a negative sense. Uh, that way, uh, I don't see. We, we, the previous uh, question, uh, two questions uh, uh, before, had to do with you know supporting Ukraine to win or, or just not to lose. I don't, at the end of the day, I, I cannot see, maybe it's my own limitation, I do not see Russia winning uh, in Ukraine, just given how, uh, how uh, unified Ukrainian society is. They're not facing just the Ukrainian armed forces, they, they're facing all of Ukraine. Uh, and, that's, and if that's true, if that's true, uh, and if Putin continues to try, at some point that brittleness will manifest itself in more obvious ways, even though it's not as visible, uh, not as visible uh, today. In terms of Ukrainian domestic politics, uh, translating international support to sort of move Ukraine forward, as I understood it, to, uh, to rejoin Europe in, in, in all the aspects, not just in some aspects. Uh, politics in Ukraine, Ukraine is very different from Russia. I don't, I don't need to explain that uh, to this audience, I, I don't think. But because of the war and, and martial law, Ukrainian politics are, 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 are not gone the same way like they are in Russia, not at all. It's a, it's not, there's no parallel there whatsoever. But they're somewhat suspended just because of, of, of the ongoing brutalization of Ukraine. The, what used to be the pro-Moscow wing uh, of the Ukrainian political spectrum has collapsed, and rightly so. It was in many ways illegitimate to begin with. Um, and President Zelensky, someone who was naturally sort of Moscow friendly, at least Russia friendly, based on his childhood and, uh, and experiences and things like that, has become an ardent, has apparently become an ardent Ukrainian uh, patriot. And so he has uh, pushed out those who used to be in that part of the, of the spectrum, the, the Poroshenkos of this world, and you know, former President Poroshenko and others. Uh, so this political spectrum there uh, is rather limited uh, at this point. I say that, f first of all, with understanding, but also with some concern in the sense that at some point, politics will return to Ukraine. I hope they return uh, to competitive politics, return to Ukraine, hopefully with Ukraine's victory uh, in this war. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, uh, I hope there are enough checks and balances uh, 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 inherent in the Ukrainian system to make sure that those who may be close to President Zelensky don't take advantage and bring back business as usual in a number of other ways. It would be wrong. 
uh, for the Ukrainian people, to be sure, and Ukraine's uh, future, it would also be highly debilitating in terms of international support uh, for Ukraine because that would enable Ukraine's critics to point to something, and perhaps rightly so, and say, see, they have not learned the right lessons. Uh, they're not ready for EU membership or for NATO membership. Uh, I hope that doesn't, that doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't become uh, reality. There are some countervailing forces, first and foremost the uh, civil society of Ukraine, which is, which is truly amazing. If Ukraine wins in this war and Ukraine prevails in terms of uh, the old way of doing things, getting rid of that, it'll be because of civil society, not because of the political elite. And we have to help. We have to be cognizant of that, and we have to focus our support on that, uh, on that aspect as well. Can we Can we com combine the two? Let's combine, but we, we have two Okay. Yeah, okay. I apologize. Well, you're, you're the master of ceremony, so I shouldn't. Fire away. I'll be very quick. Five minutes, question and answer. I, I actually would just like to hear you talk more about uh, civil, civil society. Uh, you mentioned that as a, a watershed moment, and specifically maybe outside of the time span in which we're all looking for just updates on the current front, where things are, you know, what does it potentially look like in the future? Mm -hmm. I'll give you a, a sh very short, yeah. Um, okay. I'll ask it, but if you don't have time, we do. We'll, we'll see. It ask, ask. Time. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you've mentioned China, there's a question about China, but I was wondering, you know, after Ukraine prevails, what does it look like for the kind of Russia's um, landscape and Putin's landscape if you talk about the influence, or maybe it's negligible and that's why you left it out of your talk, but in BRICS, I mean, they, Putin mm -hmm. didn't go, he wasn't allowed to go um, for fear of being arrested, but I'm just wondering what that means for kind of like, I mean, he's used that BRICS and the expansion of BRICS in thinking about the larger global context in Russia's reach. Um, and what that would, would mean. And if that's, is it negligible or should it, what is the West thinking about that or what is the U.S. Yeah. government thinking about that in their response as BRICS continues to expand? Sure, sure. So on the, on, on the, on the BRICS question first, uh, very briefly, and, and I won't talk about what the U.S. government thinks, uh, I'll just sort of give my, my own view. Um, I mean, the BRICS membership is so, is so diverse, and especially with the expansion at this point. The expansion itself does not favor Russia. It uh, arguably favors more the PRC uh, in a number of ways. For Putin, the uh, BRICS was never a serious organization. It's an attempt, and because, uh, uh, just because of his personality, it's an attempt to demonstrate that Russia is relevant mm -hmm. and Russia has, its, uh, has given its due. Not much more than that. Uh, it's difficult to imagine that, that Brazil and India, for example, countries that uh, uh, are looking to the future, have much in common with a country like Putin's Russia, and it's called Putin's Russia especially, which is very backward looking in so many ways. Uh, so I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't hang too much on, on BRICS per se as a vibrant organization which Russia can, uh, can, from which Russia can benefit because Russia is actually becoming more of a bit player. And Putin's isolation is not, uh, it does not help uh, in that regard. Doesn't mean we shouldn't study it. Uh, obviously there's some important dynamics there, but they have little to do with Russia. Uh, at this point, I'll have even less in the future. That's my, my prediction on civil society very quickly. Um, civil society is what has saved Ukraine in February and March of 2022 in, in, in many ways. It will continue to play a key role. Uh, what my hope for civil society is that it actually becomes the proxy gen uh, generator of, uh, of new elites. One of Ukraine's big problems uh, in the decades since independence is that you've seen many of the familiar faces recycle themselves. Uh, elite uh, generation has, has been suboptimal, and this is where civil society come, come, uh, uh, has an important role to play. I'm out of time, I can, I can tell. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, no, but, but uh, that's, my, that's my very quick response. Thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, Professor Gallagher has something for you. Oh.